I'm John Rogers from Cuyahoga Falls, and we're going to see something I call always the sea, and this will be about Canada's Atlantic uh, provinces. Uh, most of this is uh, a trip uh, to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in 1994, but uh, we have all also been in those places in uh, 1974, 20 years before. But this trip, the 1994 trip, will include uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and on up through there. Now on the map, you see a little part that's sort of reddish uh, wine color, and those are the areas that we will be up in that part. And here's a little closer view. You can see uh, our own main here. This is Nova Scotia out here. This is New Brunswick. You enter Canada uh, at this point through New Brunswick, and then you go over to Nova Scotia. And then we will be up on this island. And then finally, we'll take a ferry from about here across to this is Newfoundland. And we will come up here and go over to a little part of Labrador. See, Newfoundland Island and Labrador makes up a province. This is Quebec, or Quebec coming out uh, here. This is the Great St. Lawrence Seaway, and this is the Gulf of St. Lawrence here. Now, going up, uh, entering in through New Brunswick, you go up by one of the strange, well, it's not all that strange, but it's dramatic. The Bay of Fundy and the Fundy National Park and the tides and all of that. This is some of the highest tides in the world occur here. My wife is standing at that point at uh, low tide and more or less the same point at high tide. Uh, we're in the lower part of the Bay of Fundy and already the tides, uh, the differential between low and high tide is already about 25 feet. Uh, I was born and raised along the Carolina seacoast and the tide differential between low and high was only about six to eight feet. Uh, this is Trillium back in the forest of um, Fundy National Park. Now these national parks are Canadian national parks. And there's some provincial parks as well. Now here's a uh, place, I think I was at the same place, low tide, high tide, right by Fundy National Park. And at this point, we are already about 35 feet is the tide differential. Further on up in the Bay of Fundy, over towards Nova Scotia, um, and the Bay of Fundy runs between Nova Scotia on the east and uh, New Brunswick on the west. But up in there was the highest tide recorded in the world. Tide differential now I'm talking about. And uh, it strikes me that it was about 62 feet. Up in there, 50s uh, are fairly common. And then at low tide, out in the areas close to the Bay of Fundy, you have the mud flats, lots of them. And farmland and so forth. Now these farmers have to understand that occasionally those fields are going to be flooded, and they, they do. New Brunswick is quite nice. Uh, if you're up there in the summer, it's all nice and green, and uh, they don't suffer too much from droughts. What they suffer from is it gets cold up there. And here is the Rocks Provincial Park. This is, uh, the province is still New Brunswick. Uh, my wife and I, I call them the flower pots, and I believe I've seen them in print as the flower pots. And on the map, they're, they're called the Hopewell Cape. But notice the people down there in these, uh, in these formations. Now we will go on down, and you can see why they're called the flower pots. And this is all, all this erosion is caused by the tides, the, uh, the pounding in of the surf and cutting the arches and cutting the uh, pedestals and what have you. Uh, it's sort of a neat place to be, but you must keep a watch on the tide because the tide comes in very, very swiftly. Uh, you know, not, not a matter of two minutes, but uh, five to ten minutes can make a, quite a difference in the water surging in. 
and you better be close to, um, they have a ladder there for you to uh, get out. Actually, it's a good set of steps. I shouldn't call it a ladder. Now, for the first time, my wife and I got out to uh, Prince Edward Island. We're still at New Brunswick at this point, but we are already on the ferry looking back at the little uh, uh, village there as we're going out and over to um, Prince Edward Island. Prince Edward Island is the smallest uh, of uh, the Canadian provinces by far. Um, and we have gone through Charlottestown and we're, we're sort of looking back now. We're over on the island the next morning. It was dark when we actually got over there. Um, but Charlottestown is the, uh, the capital of it. And over in the western part, and we did mostly the center part because we got off of one ferry and the next day we were gonna get on another ferry and go straight to Nova Scotia. Incidentally, you pay when you go uh, off of the island, you pay. You don't pay anything for the ferry coming onto the island. But we got uh, hit with the, with the um, more um, costly ferry that we had to pay for. But the western edge of the island is uh, the setting for Anne of Green Gables, the, uh, the stories. Very, very pretty uh, area. Again, quite green, nice, fairly flat. Lupines, they ju lupines grow alongside the road while. And uh, here in Ohio, we have uh, a hard time getting a couple of them to grow, and they're just uh, all over the place there. Nice farmlands and so forth. Uh, there are a lot of little towns shown on the map and you go in on the, the ground and you don't see anything. Uh, it, and that's because the maps are how it was laid out, not what happened uh, to it. Lighthouses, and I really like lighthouses, so you, you're gonna see a lot of them. This is a, a replica of a fishing uh, village and some of the little things that they uh, make. Um, some of the little buildings that they make to um, house certain things, fishing nets and so forth. Uh, this is a lobster boat coming back in. That was that other lighthouse o over there that you had seen. Now, uh, before we leave this area, we're over on Nova Scotia now. Uh, we've come across on the ferry a tidal bore. Tidal bores have to do with the Bay of Fundy and its shape. Dead low tide, and here's the tidal bore coming in. It is only in this area about 15 to 18 inches high. Uh, there, over in China, there's one that's about three feet high. But it's high enough that birds um, are flying quite often, you'll see them, not in these pictures, but I've photographed it before where birds were flying right over the bore because it was tumbling fish, fish that got trapped in that lead of the tide coming in. A tidal bore is uh, the change of the tide. Now I photographed uh, this at dead low tide and then I photographed it um, as the tidal bore ca came in and about five, I allowed about five minutes and uh, the tide had come in at about six feet in that five minutes from the time that tidal bore hit. So that's another phenomenon you, that you can see in the um, Bay of Fundy, but the tides themselves are the great ones. We're at Halifax now and uh, looking back at the bridge we came across and some of the um, buildings, you can see they have RVs there too. But they also have pretty gardens. Uh, and we were, we were there when um, uh, another group got there, so this uh, piper is piping for them, not for us. But uh, we enjoyed it just the same. But the gardens were well kept and very colorful. This is in Halifax, and Halifax is the capital of Nova Scotia. And Halifax is where we are going to join up with a Globus tour 
to do the, the rest of our 1994 part. He's up on the Citadel and we're coming down. There's one of the towers of the Citadel. And we've dropped down to a very picturesque little place that um, we tourists like to go. And this is Peggy's Cove. It's southwest of Halifax. But if you can only see one picturesque little fishing village, and believe me, you're going to see a lot more than that today, um, then Peggy's Cove is a good one to see. Very colorful. Uh, notice no trees. Very um, battering winds and so forth. Very hard for trees to get started and grow. And then on north of Halifax, we uh, went to, a, we're on the tour now. We went to Sherbrooke Village. Sherbrooke Village is being done uh, by bringing in different buildings that they have found and uh, putting them all together. This is the Temperance Hall and all sorts of uh, houses along the way. It had just rained, that's why you um, uh, see that. And even a lumber mill that has a water wheel uh, is there. Notice all those lupines in the foreground. And then we were going over to Cape Breton Island and you use the Canso Causeway. That's, that's this thing here to get over there. And once you're over there, um, there are a lot of things. There's the Brassador Lake area and that is a saltwater lake, a huge one. And this is the Alexander Graham Bell Museum. <clears throat> and from the grounds of it, the little lighthouse, and this is that lake I was talking about. And somewhere over there, I think it's in that group. Yeah, I believe it's in that group is the summer home of Alexander Graham Bell. We didn't go over to the home. We, were, we just stayed at the museum. All sorts of little evidence of fishing and so forth. A few things in the, in the Alexander Graham Bell Museum. He did a lot of work um, with hovercraft type things too. Besides the telephone, obviously. Different shapes. And the museum itself is a neat, uh, neat shape, sort of a tribute to him. And then after we left, <clears throat> after we left there, excuse me, um, we went over towards uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and we stopped at a little place to, to get some coffee, and here were all of the flags of the Canadian provinces plus the flag of Canada, uh, which was sort of neat. Then from an earlier trip, I uh, always liked this arch along the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but our trip was not going to there. Our first little fine um, um, harbor is uh, the Marjorie Harbor. And uh, I get carried away taking pictures of little fishing boats, but um, uh, they're, they're sort of neat. Now look very closely in the middle and you can see a lobster. They had not decided what to do with this lobster, but it was about a 20-pounder, and they had just, uh, just caught it. I never did hear what happened to it, but that was one of the people in our group that was actually holding it. The um, boats out of that little harbor that you just saw, they go out through this passageway to get out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and many of them are going out to check their lobster pots and so forth. And lobster pots all over the place. They're called lobster pots. It's actually a trap. It's baited and their lobsters go in and then cannot get out. And then the whole trap is pulled up. And they, they're very, uh, you have to watch very closely 
the size of the lobsters. You can get fined rather severely if you're taking out uh, lobsters that are too small. As a matter of fact, I think you can lose your license if you um, are habitual at that. So they watch it very carefully. But a very picturesque uh, little uh, village uh, there. And then we move on up to a place called Chattacamp. Now, Chattacamp is an Acadian village. Acadian means a peaceful land, but more to what they're all about is that Acadian also means that they are descended from the early settlers. And it is signified, and it'll be a while before I'll show it to you, it's signified by putting butterflies on the front of your house. We're on uh, Cape Breton Island, and this is Cape Breton Highlands National Park. This along here is what's known as the Cabot uh, Trail. Cabot was one of the explorers. And we're on the western side of the island, which is battered by the Gulf of St. Lawrence. <clears throat> nice distant views. And we're going to move down in there a little bit. There you go. We didn't notice anybody in swimming. It was June, and I guess the water was pretty cold. And then we didn't stay at this place, but they showed it to us. This is the Celtic Lodge area. This is a great place to uh, see lobster pots and uh, the working of the lobsters. The, the lobster industry, and also some beautiful views. Now you're seeing all of the markers down in here. Every one of those has a lobster pot down on the bottom. And there are all sorts of different colors, so the different lobster men will know which are theirs. And you dare not pull up somebody else's. And there is the lodge up there, and you can see right down below, at the foot of the rocks, a lot of uh, lobster markers. And on the other side of that little uh, peninsula, I guess you would call it an awful lot of them, markers. And then we've moved over. We're still in Nova Scotia, but we're at Louisburg National Historic Park, and that is French. Um, that was done by French. As a matter of fact, you were supposed to speak to this guy in French for him to let you in. Our, we had one person that was our leader that could speak French, and uh, so we all got in. But this is quite an arsenal. Lewisburg National Historic Park. It's on Nova Scotia, right out on the Atlantic. This, uh, this gate right here is the uh, Frederick Gate, and that was one of the main entrances, probably the main entrance to this place. There it is again. Now, this lady um, works as a um, sort of a maid here, and she dresses that way, but she, she will stop and talk to you, and she'll tell you about all of her costume and everything and what she does and so forth. Uh, a very friendly place, as a matter of fact. One of the wells. And I thought this guy was interesting. Now, he did not stop. I guess nobody asked him to stop, but I thought his costume was really neat. And this one did a lot of talking for us. He was, um, he was a guard, and he was showing us um, how his um, gun was put together, and then he actually fired it for us and uh, told us something about guard duty in the old uh, Lewisburg uh, fortress. Over in uh, this area now is called the King's Bastion area. And right under that is this little chapel within the main building. Stockaded stuff. Just uh, 
They've, they've tried to do it just like it was, even down to the cannons. And um, they had these, uh, we heard these guys as we were approaching and we just got a glimpse of them, but now we're out right in front of them. And then this man, uh, he was the commanding officer of the uh, fellow with the rifle that I showed you a moment ago, uh, and he ch chatted with us a while. <clears throat> Notice the fleur de lance on there, which depicts French, which means French, which means that he must be French. Um, little gardens there. Now the pictures inside, you're not allowed flash, and the pictures inside, everything is fairly dark. Um, so mostly everything uh, that I actually use is outside. And they're doing a walk repair just the same way as it's been done for years. Old wooden wheelbarrows and so forth and them in costume. We're back up by the visitor center now looking back uh, for a last look at Lewisburg, a National Historic Park. And then we're going to go over to Newfoundland. We will land right about in, in here, and we'll be on this side going up to here. We'll cross over to uh, Labrador, and then we will come back down and go over this way and end up at St. John's in here. That is Newfoundland Island. And as I mentioned, uh, the province of Newfoundland also includes Labrador. As a matter of fact, the license plates uh, actually have Newfoundland and Labrador on them. And so here is a, as we're uh, coming into uh, this area uh, to point a box, um, we see a lighthouse. It's get, getting um, towards evening, but, um, and you see a glare of the sun on the water but um, uh, the sun is uh, going to be up for a while. Very colorful place, but notice, no trees. Very tough for trees to get uh, growing in these places that are really windswept. Now, on up in Newfoundland, um, there are quite a few trees. As a matter of fact, timber, timber is one of the industries. Um, but um, this is what, what she looks like. I'm still on a ferry taking these uh, pictures. And that's the ferry that we came over. That was the, uh, I believe it was the Caribou um, ferry that we came across on. And then I have no other words for, for these um, little mountains here except what our tour director called them, and he called them the Dolly Parton Peaks. And we passed them, they're very impressive. And then we got on up to where we were gonna spend the night. We had passed a moose or two along the way, uh, but we got to the place called Cornerbrook. And this is Glenmill Inn. Uh, this goes back a little, little ways, not too far, but Glenmill Inn, we're gonna spend two nights in Glenmill Inn. Now, a few things about Newfoundland and Labrador. They're the newest province, which was the 10th, and, uh, and only in 1949. Um, the total province area is about 156,000 square miles, but the island of Newfoundland uh, itself is only 43,000 square miles, so a little larger than Ohio, which is at about 41,000 square miles. Uh, these, uh, oh, the people at the, uh, at, uh, the Glen Mill Inn were so happy with these uh, swans that had had the little ones, and they were hopeful that the little ones would stay around and um, they would have some more swans because the population was rather low. We went out along Humba Arm to the Bay of Islands, and that's where we're going now. Uh, very colorful stuff, and a lot of the boats are painted. I guess um, you have such a long winter up here that uh, when you can show some color, you really show it. But uh, it's a rainy day, so uh, don't expect too much in the way of uh, pictures. Our first uh, village here is Frenchman's Cove, and you can see a, a graveyard in between uh, there. I think I move in on there in a little bit. And as we moved towards it, uh, we ducked into a little place where a lot of fishing boats were, uh, were kept. 
Now, some of them are uh, a fairly modern and, and have uh, some radar on them, of course, but others are just these, just an outboard motor, and you're going out um, uh, and you pull it, pull it up on these logs when you come back in so the tides won't, uh, won't hurt it and especially won't break it away. But very colorful, the red, the red boats, a little orange inside, and, uh, and the racks that they bring them up on, I guess that's what they call them. <clears throat> lobster pots, lobster pots all over the place. Now, when they go out, they, they slide over this side and then finally go out along that uh, rocky coastline there to get out here so they won't hit this. Now the next little town up is Lock Harbor, and um, again a cemetery on b behind it there, and you can see it a little closer now. And I believe we had lunch at Lock Harbor. And here's a little uh, red-headed girl with uh, freckles that my wife uh, talked to. And here's some of the uh, fairly dejected um, uh, fishermen, because um, all the uh, fishing is restricted on the island now, and um, while they aren't right by the cod fishing, uh, they're on the um, uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence side, and the cod fishing is more out in the ocean. Cod is now under a moratorium, and you cannot take it. A lot of the um, lines and so forth. And then um, what they were selling is haddock and um, hopefully getting some money from it. And this was the uh, guy right, right back in here that they depended on. He was the buyer. Now I mentioned if you're an Acadian or descended from the very early settlers, you might have a butterfly on your house. And I found one here. In, um, in this uh, place at Lock Harbor. We're moving back al along uh, Humber Arm now, at, and we're almost into Cornerbrook. Uh, Captain Cook was up on the same hill that we are up on now when he sailed these waters. And this is the same Captain Cook that explored over in Alaska and in the Hawaiian Islands. Now looking from our hill, that's uh, Glenmill Inn where we're staying over in there. And I mentioned that it was a rainy day. Well, the next day was a, a little better, and we were going over to Grammont National Park on our way on, on up. Um, but uh, let me give you just a couple more things uh, about the province. Uh, the province population is only 567,000. This is 1980, and that's only four people per square mile. Uh, it wouldn't take us more than, if we were populating the county that, I'm, um, that I live in, which is Summit County, Ohio, if we populated it at the same rate, we'd only need about 400, maybe 500 people is all. And sailors from Bristol, England reached um, Newfoundland in about 1481, they think. <clears throat> Now, these are called the tablelands up there um, of Groman National Park. I could probably pass that off as the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. It looks just like the Bighorns. Uh, and this is one of the uh, one of the bays. This is Bonnie Bay, B-O-N-N-E, Bonnie Bay. That's salt water coming in off the Gulf of uh, St. Lawrence. Well, part of it is fresh water, I'm sure, because there's streams dropping into it, but it has direct access to the sea. And this is the mountain for which it's named, Grammont Mountain. 
very rocky. And this one is maybe even rockier, but it's got a little bit more green on it. The trees grow a little further up on it. And then we're going into the place where we will uh, have lunch. We ate a lot of soup up in, the, in this area. They make really good soup. And then we went out to, still in the park, but we went out to Lobster Cove Lighthouse. Uh, and it's, it's a very dramatic one. And the, the way, this looks like um, uh, trees growing a timberline. And in a sense, it is just like that. But here it's caused by latitude, not, uh, not um, uh, elevation like out in our own, uh, Colorado Rockies. And this stuff, they call it Tuckamore. Instead of um, Timberline, they call it Tuckamore. But I just got carried away with photographs of this lighthouse. This is, this is a real beauty. Very jagged stuff down below there. Sort of an artistic one there, you might say, with those clouds in the background. We got to go in here and uh, we saw the place where the, uh, where the tenda used to stay and so forth. And looking back now from the lighthouse, that's a little town where we uh, had lunch that day. Going on further, um, this is a... Uh, uh, sort of a landlocked field. Uh, we did not actually get to go out to it. Um, I think you have to hike out to it, but down in there, there is a lake, and this actually was carved by a glacier during that age a few eons ago. Uh, we're going out now to Broom Point, and um, Broom Point is on a rocky, rocky a uh, area but it is a fishing place, and that's their restroom. Uh, notice the, uh, the um, poles that are holding their little outhouse in place so it won't get blown off, off by the wind. And in, the, in this building here, they have a um, sort of a museum, but oh, was it dark in there. You had to let your eyes adjust, and I don't carry a flash, so you won't see anything there. You can look at the rocks and the, and the boats and everything else in between. And then there's a house there. And in that house, and I find this hard to believe, but in that tiny little house, two families uh, I think about 12 people lived when they were fishing out of there because the place I showed you that was the museum was the, the place where the boats were, uh, were kept. Those were all people in our party. Then we moved on north some more and we went to Point Achaw. I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation. This is an archaeological site, Prince Philip, not Prince Philip, Philip's Garden. And the burials out here took place three to 4,000 years ago. So it's an Indian burial ground on, on out beyond the sign out in here. But there is a nice museum there, and that was pretty good. Now we're at Plum Point, and we're going to spend the night there. But I f found a place where I could actually photograph this phenomenon that we had heard about. Uh, this is the front of the house. And it is required that you have a front door on your house. But everybody uses the back side of it. And a lot of people don't even put steps up to the front. Um, and so they call this the mother-in-law door. That's their, their term, not mine. And uh, I photographed this uh, wash on the line and the, and the wood. And you can see a lot of things about life up here in that one photograph. Here's the wood, and here is a snowmobile, the wash on the line, uh, just a lot of things that you got to have. <clears throat> and then we took this ferry over what they call um, Iceberg Alley. It's actually the Belle Isle Strait which was uh, taking us over to Labrador. 
Uh, the ferry crosses Belle Isle Strait, and uh, the landing was uh, not at Labrador, but at Blanche Sablon in Quebec. And uh, we are approaching that town now, still on the ferry. And um, we have moved over now, and I believe we are now uh, actually in Labrador. We stayed at uh, Lance Claire in Labrador, just one night, but enough to give us a little of the flavor of Labrador and the fact that trees are very scarce and so forth. And um, um, here's what the town looked like, not a single tree in sight. Uh, some little uh, shrubbery in, in on the left there, but not much of that even. And then offshore, you're seeing the first iceberg um, behind that uh, house. We'll see some more of those as we go along. That's that same one um, out uh, from the uh, little village. And then we pass this roaring river. It really was going. And right alongside of it, dropping down uh, to it, was this uh, beautiful waterfall. Uh, we're going up to uh, Red Bay, which is an old whaling town. Uh, you only have about 25 miles, 20 to 25 miles of actual paved road in this part of Labrador, and I think this is most of the paved road in the whole place. This is Red Bay, an old whaling town, and it's got a museum uh, there. Um, a lot of rock, too. And then uh, when we're coming back, um, we pass through uh, Lanza Loop, and we're going out to a burial site. Um, and this is a marker, but the burial, they think, is back where those people are to the, to the left there. And this was, um, uh, goes back quite a, quite a ways um, for the um, child who lived, they think, 7,500 years ago, a um, long time. And actually on the same road, we were going out to the, to, um, Point Amour uh, Lighthouse. Beautiful clouds, nice seascapes along here. An occasional um, uh, iceberg. And here is the Point Amour Lighthouse. Kind of cold, though, kind of cold. And a burial place on the way back. Notice the rocks. And there are a few trees, not many, not big, but a few. Then we had to wait a little while when we were back at the, um, the ferry site. And uh, this is a, um, uh, an ice machine because they would, uh, they would use it and the fishermen would pay to ice their catches uh, so that there'd be no spoiling. Boy, you don't let anything spoil up here. It's, uh, it's too tough a living uh, to let your fish go to waste. And uh, this was a, a boat that now had turned to um, crabbing much more than lobsters because the lobster population had fallen off in this area. Then coming back across the Belle Isle Straits, we landed at uh, St. Bobby uh, on, back on Newfoundland Island. And all of the rest will be on Newfoundland Island down uh, to, uh, well, I'll tell you, the birds that you see. Now before you get up in arms, these are seal skins. And uh, these are uh, native people who have the right to take seals for seal skins. <clears throat> this was one of, has always been one of their big, uh, um, uh, it's hard to call it an industry, one of the things that uh, helped them survive was uh, the taking of seal. And there is a moose. I've seen bigger moose out in the American no Northwest. Um, than, uh, than I have here, but um, we saw a number. That's the only halfway decent picture I got. But look at that iceberg off of this uh, little village. 
and yes, that is snow. We're in the, oh, more or less the very northern part of, um, of um, Newfoundland Island, and we're going out to the Lancel Meadows National Historic Site. Now, this one also has um, uh, a, a notation on the United Nations of its importance as a site, because this was the Viking settlement back in 1000 AD. Now, of course, much of it had to be re recreated, but this is the very spot where the Vikings uh, settled, and uh, there, there are how the um, dwellings were, covered over with uh, soil, and what a place to pick. It must have been bitter cold all the time. I know it is today, all winter long, but this was the Viking uh, site, 1000 AD, long before Columbus ever hit the, the New World. Uh, and um, it, it was sort of a thrill to, uh, to be there uh, to this very early um, European settlement, you might say, on the North American continent. But look at the barren land and so forth um, uh, that they had to deal with. Of course, they were dependent probably mostly on fish. But uh, that's a settlement, and out beyond it is rough, rough uh, uh, seawater. Uh, this is the northern Atlantic now coming down um, while well, the water is coming down from uh, the Arctic Ocean uh, at this point, right alongside uh, Greenland. And some of those icebergs, um, I mentioned that that other place was called Iceberg Alley. We didn't see too many uh, icebergs there, but, but we did uh, later on. Um, and they say icebergs accumulate outside of St. John's too. This is a little fishing village on the way to St. Anthony's. St. Anthony's was, uh, we had a meal there, and that was the only bad meal of the whole tour. Um, but uh, another subject, also at St. Anthony's, as this is the Grenfell House Museum, and there will be a statue in town. And my, my wife is in a bright place there, so I could take the, uh, the picture. Um, he was an early doctor and very dedicated. Uh, and um, they say that he just did all kinds of things for these uh, uh, people. And so he became uh, more or less a hero, uh, you might say. But that's uh, how the house uh, looked. And there is the statue of him in the small little downtown. Not that St. Anthony's is any big place but that's the statue of him. And another little village as we go along. And we're going to be going to uh, a place called uh, Arches Provincial Park. Now, when you see the, um, uh, the, the wood like this, that is going to be used for building. This wood will be used for firewood. And there's a sled there that they put the wood on and pull it along. And this is um, Archer's Provincial Park. Now, that would be a provincial park of um, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador province. It's a double arch, and that is Gulf of St. Lawrence behind it. <coughs> oh, that's our tour director in the, uh, on the, the ground right in front of the arch. And if you really want solitude, maybe you could uh, rent one of those uh, fishing huts just, uh, just north of the arch. I uh, would be convinced that you would get all the solitude that you could really stand. But it's an interesting arch. I'd never seen one like this, and we've seen quite a few out in the west in the uh, uh, U.S. We're right on the Trans-Canada Highway now, and here is one of the things that uh, brings in money. And notice the beautiful forest behind the truck, because parts of Newfoundland are heavily forested, and other parts are just um, stone and just low grasses and so forth. Um, so it's interesting to see a truck like that. 
Then we stopped in the Great Falls, Windsor area. We actually spent the night there, and this is one of the old sawmills. Uh, can you imagine cutting your lumber that way with the, uh, with the uh, saw blade, one person up above and one person down below making lumber? Different um, uh, little buildings around there that you could see, and there's an outhouse complete with crescent on it. And then also in the same um, area of um, uh, the Great Falls, Windsor area, not out by the sawmill, is this um, little exhibit. There's a museum here also, and this is the Beothox. Uh, these were early people that the white man actually saw, but those people are now extinct. And this is three of the different ways that they would live, three of the different kinds of dwellings that they would use. Now, this is not exactly a dwelling, but they would carry, they would carry this with them so that they would have some place to protect them um, when they were spending the night and they are extinct. And a paper mill right there at the Great Falls, Windsor area. And I'm not showing it to you for the paper mill so much as I'm showing it to you for the water that's running right by the paper mill. Uh, this is a stream and uh, it had been dammed slightly, <laughs> slightly, you, you dam it. Uh, and so they did a fish ladder, a salmon ladder to get the salmon up above. Um, and um, that's a natural falls there. And this is the fish ladder. Um, the salmon come up uh, this in various uh, stages. From, from there, they can't go any further there. It's impossible for, for them to. So they come up through this and uh, make their way up into the spawning grounds on above the, uh, the ladder. This is done in the, uh, in the Canadian and in the, in the uh, U.S. Uh, Northwest to, um, to uh, take the um, uh, place of uh, the salmon jumping the cascades as they go up. We're on our way into a place called Twilling Gate now, and I'm uh, going to see a few um, more little villages as we go along. But we are up in... Um, that place that has a museum. This is the museum. This was the finest museum of the entire trip. It really was good. And behind it, there was this cemetery and the Gulf of St. Lawrence, of course. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's the open Atlantic. We, we are away from uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. That's the open Atlantic. And here are some of the mosses and lichens and fungi growing. Uh, and uh, not much in the way of trees, rocks, and so forth. And then d looking down from the museum is the old uh, uh, church there. That's our bus off to the right there. We had some coffee here and just a little uh, stop, the steeple of, of the church um, there. And then inside that museum, A lot of the um, um, people are Roman Catholic, but the Anglican Church of uh, Canada and the United Church of Canada also are prominent. Ninety percent of the people live near the seacoast, and a third of the people live in communities of less than a hundred. English, Irish, Scottish, and French mainly. And less than two percent were born outside of Canada. Less than 2% were born outside of Canada. Those pictures were all in that beautiful Twilling Gate uh, Museum. And if you've heard of the uh, um, uh, geographic uh, designation of the Canadian Shield, Labrador is part of that uh, great uh, formation. Uh, we are out now at Long Point Lighthouse. And you're going to like Long Point. Uh, it's a, it's a real neat place, really rugged. 
But look at that red of that lighthouse. That's really something. Long point. <clears throat> And while I have the Canadian flag on there, I'd like, you to, I'd like to read the words to you. Uh, I don't think this is the national anthem, but I like this one better. In days of yore from Britain's shore, wool the dauntless hero came and planted firm Britannica's flag on Canada's, Canada's fair domain. Here may it wave our boast and pride and join in love together the thistle, that would be Scotland. Shamrock would be Ireland. Rose, that would be England. The maple leaf, forever. The maple leaf, our emblem dear. The maple leaf, forever. God save our queen and heaven bless. The maple leaf, forever. That is one of the reddest lighthouses that I have ever seen. I wonder why they didn't work um, uh, something about the the uh, the dragon in that, so that they could get whales into that um, poem or song. Also, little flowers, little flowers, like you'd have in tundra. And there's an iceberg right off from it. And so we're going to make our way down to uh, Ganda now, a little fishing village along the way. <clears throat> Lots of little fishing villages. But here at Ganda, this is the silent witness memorial to 259 men of the 101st Airborne who crashed here in 1985 on the way back from a peacekeeping mission. And later on, when we were over at Harbor Grace, I saw again the poem High Flight. And I use it in one of my other shows. But it was written by John McGee, Jr., an American volunteer in the Canadian Air Force in World War II. I think he was from Pennsylvania. And the last few lines here hold out the hope I have for those men. But high flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the sky on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I have climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mine I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. And as I was standing there, as we were standing there watching, this plane from Ganda came over the hillside where that crash took down the trees, right, that you're looking at. And here are the flags there, the Canadian flag, the Newfoundland and Labrador flag, and the U.S. flag. And here is the symbol of the 101st Airborne. The 101st Airborne, uh, some of the, from that group, uh, some of the landings at, at D-Day behind the lines took place in France. And here's the memorial. It's a silent witness. Going over now into Terra Nova National Park, we're out on a little boat and we're in a field and uh, we were supposed to pull up a lobster trap, and we did. This is sort of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And they actually allow this boat to jig for cod. Um, and the fishermen are a little uh, tense about that, but they never get more than one or two. Uh, and they didn't get any today. Yes, I guess they did get one the day we were there. Look at the birds in there. 
and this is my, my wife's hand, and she's holding what was in the lobster trap, just a little sea urchin, nothing more. But then, in the jigging for cod, uh, and you're looking out to the mouth of the field now, out into the great north uh, Atlantic and on over, and feeding this is the Arctic Ocean. And then here is a bull eagle. We saw a number, but oh, they're all so hard to photograph. But I got this one coming down. They had gotten one cod, and it was obvious the cod was not going to live. So it was thrown out, and there were bald eagles sitting there, and this one came in to get that cod, and did. So I consider that uh, a fairly decent picture for me of bald eagles. This one will not come into focus, but it's a nest there. Now that one's a little better. That's the young on the right and the mature bald eagle on the left. Um, the maturity is the white feathers on the head, and that is at about four to five years old. That's one landing in the trees there. And here you can see the white head very prominently. And we're still on the boat now, and we're coming in. And now, now we have uh, moved on, and we're at uh, Clarenville, and that's uh, Clarenville from our hotel. <clears throat> Our tour director said he would like them to paint this so he could pass it off as an iceberg, but it's all rock. Looks just like the icebergs. But what we're going for right at the moment is Hearts Content. That's the name of a little town. And this is the cable station where the first transatlantic cable came in in 1865 after many attempts. I think there were at least five attempts that failed. Um, the cable broke or something happened. But there is the original cable coming up out of the ground, just coming across Hot's Content Harbor, um, coming across uh, to that right by the parking lot, through this water, buried under this water, a lighthouse off in the distance, a little bit more there, and then we're going to look at the building where all the transatlantic cable work was first done. This is a museum now, and I do have a few pictures just of a couple of things inside that showed up uh, with enough light. But it is a museum worth going to, and it, it really has a lot of history packed into it. And then we went on over to Harbor Grace. These aren't very far apart. Um, this was the kickoff or the landing point for many of the early airplane flights. This is the old uh, church there. I don't believe I have the, yeah, that's St. Paul's Church. Uh, the little airfield, they say, is still out there. We didn't go to it because the memorial is right in this museum. As a matter of fact, this thing here is sort of a museum to a lot of these uh, early flyers across the North Atlantic. Uh, over to Europe. And Amelia Earhart and Wiley Post were among those flyers. But one thing I w just got a kick out of, our tour director knew about this dog, so he called the museum ahead of time and asked them if they could get the lady with the dog, with the Newfoundland dog, down to there. And this is the dog with webbed feet. He's a great big guy, very gentle, and I noticed the lady with him had a, had a full-size bath towel. And I asked, what's that for? She said, he slobbers so much, I don't go anywhere without a towel when I have him. <laughs> but he was a, a joy to uh, be able to see. Here's a little memorial to Amelia Earhart. And that's uh, like uh, some of the places in the country, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to make a nice restaurant out of this place. Supposedly, this old derelict freighter is going to be a restaurant someday, but uh, it's um, still standing there. Nothing has happened as yet. 
Then we went on over before we went into St. John's to Cape Spear National Historic Site. This is uh, the place that's the easternmost point in North America. That picture that you just saw was the new light. This is the old light. And this is the oldest in Canada, dating to 1834, 35, somewhere around that. We're out on the Atlantic now, and we're inside where the, um, uh, where the uh, keeper would have uh, stayed in the old one. And notice the cliffs down, really a drop off there. Lots of rock, a lot of surf coming in. Now this was fortified at one, uh, at one time, and so you pass different cannons sort of in disrepair as you move around and go to the point. Those people are standing at the point, which is the easternmost point in North America, at Cape Spear, right out at the lighthouse. And moving now towards St. John's, we go through a little town called Petty Harbor. This is a town used in movies. Um, and so if you recognize things, um, uh, you'd understand why. I think uh, this was the town that was uh, used in part of Free Willy. Neat little town. And then we moved into St. John's, and we spent a couple of nights in St. John's. Now, this is the Narrows coming in, and this is St. John's Harbor, and I'm up on the, uh, the hill, Signal Hill, uh, at this point. Now I'm in our hotel looking out of the Narrows, uh, you're going to see that little uh, uh, lighthouse cluster there, and this is where you will uh, see the um, Marconi Tower, or the Cabot Tower, on, and uh, this is where Marconi received uh, the first wireless. That's that little lighthouse. Now, out in front there, and before you get uh, too far out, this is where uh, they have accumulations of icebergs, and then the wind blows in, and these people in St. John's really freeze. Uh, that is uh, Cabot Tower up on uh, uh, top of Signal Hill. You get the idea that I like lighthouses. And that is Cabot Tower. And um, I have this written down, let me see, in 1901, Marconi received the first transatlantic wireless signal right in that place. Looking down off of there um, into um, uh, the harbor, notice the fortifications, all the cannons around there. If you uh, were coming in those narrows, you had to face all of those guns. A lot of interesting things around uh, St. John's. Now this is St. John's, J-O-H-N apostrophe S. Uh, don't mix it up with St. John, which is uh, down in New Brunswick. Now, this is a map, and this area, this is the end of uh, Newfoundland here, but this map is the great fishing, the cod fishing uh, area there. You don't actually fish for cod, you, you jig it, you um, bring hooks uh, into the side of the fish and pull the fish up that way. But that's, uh, that's the great um, George's Banks, and that's where it is, um, uh, or the Grand Banks, and that's where it is forbidden to fish for cod at the, this time. The moratorium has been on a couple of years, and it's still on the last I heard. But if you like a, a very colorful seaport, St. John's would, uh, would really be a great one to go to. That almost looks like it's a model, but I assure you those are actual cars and that is a building. Then you get sort of carried away with the way they put dormer 
windows out of places. And that's where the Trans-Canada Highway really begins. That is zero mile of the Trans-Canada Highway. Goes all the way out to Vancouver Island on the Pacific. Golden rain tree was blooming uh, when we were there. Now we've dropped down south of St. John's and we're going out to some islands. Uh, that is Bull, Bull uh, Bay Bull, they call it. And Bay Bull is where one of the German U-boats came in and surrendered in World War II, right in this harbor that you're looking at. We're going out in one of those uh, boats uh, there. Uh, it is a bad day. It looks all right here, but out at sea, it's very rough and it's raining. Uh, but we're going, instead of three islands, we're just going to one. You can already see birds even before we leave the, the, the um, mainland. The mainland here is actually Newfoundland Island. A lot of birds are already visible. <clears throat> And those are puffins, those are Atlantic puffins. Now, before I get too far in these uh, birds, I want to read you uh, something. We went to a show that night in St. John's, and this was the song that they uh, sang to uh, bid us uh, farewell. This land of ours we adore. The rocks and sea are grand. But what is the greatest part? This is straight from the heart. It's the people of this land. The wind may beat at our door. The sun may be gray and dark. But the friends on all that's close to our heart. It's our home, Newfoundland. Other bird people could tell you all of these. They have razor bills. They have guillemots. They have mirrors. Atlantic puffin, I mentioned. And you can see some gulls in here as well. But the puffins are, are sort of a favorite bird. They're sort of the clown of the sea, but boy, they're a real flyer. And they can really bring in, the, bring in the fish. But all of this was very close to the island. And then finally, we are crossing the border back into the state of Maine, into the United States, to end our tour of Canada's Atlantic provinces.